All right, well, here's a few news articles. Uh, Rolls Royce wants to make miniature nuclear plants. It's kind of a new thing. They say they are going to be like Lego. And this way, they'll be able to have small nuclear plants all over the place instead of making big ones that then have to transmit the power long distances. Um, <clears throat> those are called modular nuclear plants. And even a small one is still not all that small. They say it's like building them out of Lego, but they're going to bring the cost down to 2 billion pounds each. So it's still not something you can buy casually. Anyway, we'll see what comes of that. Um, most serious uh, energy analyses I've seen have said that we don't have any choice if we want to do anything about global warming or improve human health. Uh, the only choice we can really use is nuclear. The only thing that's really going to produce enough power to actually significantly quit burning fossil fuels in, uh, say, the next several decades. Well, a lot of people are talking about wind power, but apparently it's not going to make enough energy anytime soon. So uh, there's another vaccine, a second one. Uh, this one from uh, another company, Moderna. So the previous one was from Pfizer, and that was, um, I think, a German company or Swiss. And the good thing about that, as far as I'm concerned, is that they did not take money from Project Warp Speed, and they were never under the control of Trump or the CDC. So they're not subject to the political pressure, which has been revealed to greatly influence and modify what the CDC says. So if Pfizer says it's safe, I'm a lot more inclined to believe it's safe. It didn't get a chance to go through the corrupt United States government. Um, but the Pfizer vaccine is very hard to distribute because it has to be cooled to minus 70 degrees centigrade. And uh, that is not easy to do. Whereas this one, has to be cooled for long-term storage, but it can be thawed and put in a normal freezer for 30 days. So it's much cheaper and easier to distribute, and it also claims to be 94% effective, so that's about as good as anything can be. So it sounds great. Um, supposedly, some doses will be available in December. That'll only be for, like, frontline healthcare workers or something. The rest of us will get it uh, the middle of next year or so. So that'll be nice. Hopefully nothing bad comes up to stop all that. I think they're still undergoing safety trials and efficacy trials. It's not like they're really ready to distribute just yet, but that's expected pretty soon. Uh, I've, I've been, I took a trip to the Apple store and I've been taking walks and I see it. a lot of people in San Francisco don't bother wearing masks anymore. They don't bother social distancing. And studies show this is all over the country. Like 38% of people plan on having Thanksgiving gatherings with people. Um, when will the cafeteria be open again? Oh, I don't think for a year. I don't think they'll open any of the uh, city college face-to-face -face stuff. Uh, there's no official statement at all. So I don't think the college is going to open next semester, except for a small number of classes that request that. And realistically, I don't even think the ones that request it are going to get to do it. Because that was like two, three weeks ago, they said you can request to have face-to-face. -face, and now we're just entering the huge surge and they just announced today that they're shutting down California again. So I don't think uh, next semester, I think there's no hope. Maybe in the fall. More likely, I would say 2022. Um, anyway, here's the uh, a color-coded chart of how the virus is spreading in the United States. There really are other colors, it's just none of them are ever used. This is the maximum most terrible situation and it applies to basically every state. It is out of control. This is what everyone predicted from the very beginning that the worst surge would be in the winter, and so it is. And California's growth is outrageous, and I can see it because everyone's tired of precautions and they're just not bothering. And uh, so they pulled the emergency break and declared they're shutting down everything today. It was not even waiting until tomorrow. So closing all indoor dining and all kinds of other things. Um, I'm highly skeptical that this will have any effect because in my observation, the police completely ignore mask mandates and the postal workers completely ignore mask mandates. So I don't think anyone's going to enforce it if those people don't even set an example. Uh, I think uh, I think America's had it with lockdowns and they're just going to ignore it and spread the disease. And uh, the only thing for people who want to stay alive is to hide and don't go out hardly at all. That's my plan. Uh, the Universities have been requiring students to install these phone apps that are supposed to tell you if you have coronavirus, 
they are a monumental failure and the EFF, which is a very good organization, has said this is just nonsense, quit making people use them, all they do is invade your privacy and contribute nothing to your health, which appears to be quite clear. Um, so they are calling for universities to knock it off, which is probably the right move. Those things just didn't work. If they worked, there might be some benefit in them, but all they do is uh, invade your privacy and not make any safer in practice. The ponies are awards for massive accomplishments, like the most biggest accomplishments each year worldwide in cybersecurity. And the reason I got interested in this is because Axiom X is on this list. And as you heard, um, I'm, the, our team just won first place in the regional pen testing contest, beating out Stanford and many other colleges. And Axiom X is an X student in these classes. He's in San Francisco, and he's on this list for the iPhone jailbreak. Uh, which was Checkmate, which was used to make the uh, the jailbreak, which is indeed an awesome accomplishment. There's a lot of uh, an epic achievement. I think he deserves it. Anyway, he says there's a lot of stiff competition from the other epic achievements, and I imagine there is, but even being on the list is a great thing, and uh, I'm very pleased to see him there. I didn't teach him how to do that. You know, I just taught him the basics to get started, and he raced way ahead of me, of course. I'm not that advanced. I'm not winning any prizes like that, but but he is, and that's what should happen. The students should race past me and go much further than I have. Uh, so Apple's Big Sur, um, Apple has done something that Microsoft has played with and never done too harshly, which is to get everybody else out of the kernel. And if you take the 126 class, we're talking a lot about the kernel and debugging the kernel. Uh, the kernel is the heart of the operating system and Microsoft software is uh, Microsoft operating systems suffer greatly from letting other people write code that goes in the kernel. And Apple has just decided to kick everybody else out of the kernel. And that means that you can't really write good security software anymore. And so now they've shown that Apple apps like the Apple store just blast right past the firewall and your VPN because no software you added can capture that traffic. And so, uh, they're, they're very worried about this, and it is an interesting issue. Um, the question is whether you would like to let third-party utilities affect the security of the device at a fundamental level, and then you could perhaps make the device more secure by getting carefully chosen VPNs, firewalls, antivirus, and all that, or to just kick all third-party things out of the kernel and trust Apple to keep you safe. And then you're stuck with Apple's official decisions about all those things. And it does seem to me like... Uh, Apple iPhone is very much on the second side. You don't have control of the iPhone. The software is totally under Apple's control and you trust them to keep you safe. And in practice, that's pretty good. But for desktop machines and laptops, most people are not willing to accept that. So a lot of people are complaining about Big Sur. A lot of people are complaining about the new processor. That's why I did not jump on either of them because this happens every time. Apple changes a lot. They break a lot. There is great suffering and misery. And I prefer to wait at least a year before going to the new Apple thing to uh, let the noise die down because I want it to actually work. So little big snitch didn't work for a while. Now they're claiming it works again. Little snitch is really fantastic. Uh, it's a tool that tells you all the network traffic. So you can see what traffic is coming out of every app on your device and where it's going. But of course, if they can't have a kernel extension, they can't really catch all the traffic. They claim they've updated it and it works on Big Sur, but that other article claims that there's some traffic from Apple that's going past it. So I, again, I don't really know who's right or who's wrong, but certainly the security model has changed greatly with Big Sur and there will probably be good and bad sides to that. Uh, Twitter just hired Mudge. Mudge was one of the original, most famous hackers in the world from the cult of the dead cow from decades ago, originating the modern field of ethical hacking back before they used that word. And uh, he's very widely respected. Never heard anybody say a word against him, Peter Zetko. And he's going to work at Twitter and he's going to secure the infrastructure and apparently try to do something on disinformation on Twitter. So that sounds very good that they have a real security expert working for them, hopefully helping them improve that. Um, we'll see. And uh, I heard about a uh, IOT hack that was kind of fun. And then I found that there's a well-known um, honeypot people use. And I thought this might be a good project. I might throw this in one of the classes. You can install this thing and it then acts like a gas station. Uh, uh, there's a, uh, common tool used that gas stations put on their pumps to connect to the internet. So you can check and see how much gas is left in the pump. 
and uh, many, many other such industrial things. Listen here, and they've made a honeypot that simulates a whole bunch of these things, and therefore you can test them for security. You can learn what kind of exploits go on them. You can connect them to the wide open internet and let other people attack them and record that traffic and see how many people are attacking different types of IoT devices. It's IoT is all the rage. All these hardware devices with simple little operating systems and often very vulnerable. So that's a interesting honeypot to play with there. Anyway, we're here um, at 152. And today we're down to um, the first part of investigating windows. And we'll just be doing three parts of this chapter and that'll be it. There's a guest on December 7 and there's a guest tomorrow uh, worth extra credit. And all these are worth extra credit. Kippy McGee and John Mavongo tomorrow from Qualcomm. And then David Gerard, who is a big celebrity, please come on Saturday. I'd like him to get a nice big crowd if we can get it. Um, he wrote these books. He's an expert on uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency and generally down on them, like most serious financial professionals should be, in my opinion. And uh, so he, he, we're at 1 p.m. on Saturday because he doesn't want to come at 6 p.m. because that's some terrible time in Britain. That we, that's just apparently 9 p.m. in Britain, so that's okay. So uh, check that out. And then there's even more guest lectures coming after that, this one and that one, um, Monday and Tuesday. So uh, those are all doing a lot of good, probably more good than any of my lectures, because you get information about what's going on in the real world of work. And that's the other half of what you need to know. Anyway, so let's talk about investigating Windows systems. And this is more of the traditional classical forensics. And the same thing's true of instant response, and the same thing's true of malware analysis. What you really learn in all those disciplines is how Windows works. And what you're really learning how to monitor windows, repair windows, and exploit windows. And it's mostly just learning the way windows is designed. So here we're going to talk about the file system and the prefetch, event logs, and scheduled tasks. And there's more coming later, mostly the registry. The registry is huge and a really important topic. And it is pretty baffling at first. So NTFS is Microsoft's file system. The file system is the way the disk is laid out so you can save files and retrieve them later. And there was a big change here. Originally, Microsoft started with FAT, with MS-DOS and Windows 95, Windows 98. And FAT was designed before the internet. So the only point of FAT was to save a file and then be able to find the file later and delete it and change its name and things like that. There was no consideration of security because physical access to the machine was considered authorization to do anything on that machine. There was no consideration of networking or people coming in from the outside and almost no consideration given to people sharing a computer. Um, so that was the original system. We used in floppy disks, now on thumb drives often, but not on Windows operating systems anymore. They switched in 1993 with Windows NT to the new system, the new technology file system, NTFS, which added a lot of other features to make it more secure. And the main thing they did was they moved from the file allocation table that just had a fixed record, though I think 64 bytes for every file, which meant the file name had to be short and there wasn't any permissions or anything to speak of. And they moved to this thing called the master file table. And that's a one megabyte table at the end of each disk partition that stores a lot of information about how the, um, the files are used on the volume and you can put a lot more data. This is called metadata. A file is a series of bytes that contains some information, like a program, and the metadata is all the data about the data, like the file name, the creation date, the owner, the permissions, and other things like that. And that's what's in the master file table, timestamps, the parent directory, the contents. And so the master file table itself contains the metadata. It lets you know where files are located, how big they are, who owns them, when they were last accessed and modified, and so on. And you cannot find the master file table itself, dollars MFT, in the Explorer anywhere. You're not ever supposed to directly touch it. When you create a file or delete a file, it changes the information in the master file table, but you're not supposed to go in there and directly mess with it yourself. You, so if you get raw disk access using a forensic tool or special program, then you can get access to the master file table. So it is um, on a normal hard drive. It's a series of one kilobyte records. 
with one for each file and one for each directory. And uh, the first 16 have special entries, typically starting with dollar signs, but we'll talk more about some of them later. And you can see it. One of the tools you can use is called WinHex. And you can see here, here's two normal text files. And all these dollar things are the um, automatically generated files that are used to control the way the disk is used. Things like bad cluster and so on. So uh, you have a record type, a parent record, you an uh, active inactive flag. When you delete a file, it just marks that record inactive. It does not immediately erase anything about it. That's why if you delete a file, you can undelete it if you do it like right away after you delete it and get it completely back. Anyway, then you have attributes, standard information, file name, and data. You see here what it sort of looks like. And uh, the whole thing is 1,024 bytes long. So if you delete a file, it gets marked inactive. And that, that might seem like you could get it back, but the problem is um, NTFS will always reuse the old MFT entry. So when it creates another file, which is not gonna take very long, it'll get wiped out. The dollars just indicate something that should not be visible to Windows Explorer. Um, so it's just, it's like the dot in Unix. It's a special character to indicate a special file name that should not be used by users. Anyway, um, so you have timestamps in every file. NTFS stands for New Technology File System. So MACE, these are the four file timestamps of Windows Machine. Modified, accessed, created, and entry modified. And it has two sets of these things, one in the standard information and one attached to the file name. So there's a lot of timestamps on every file. And this is a good thing because you can detect attempts to hide files. Now, if you just right click on a file and go to properties, you'll see three things here, created, modified, and accessed. Um, the entry modified is not visible here. You, you can see it if you use forensic tools. Um, so that's what it is when it was last changed, when it was last read, when the file was first created, and when the master file table is changed rather than the contents, for example, by changing the name of the file. So those are far more timestamps than it seems like you would need to keep. And in fact, Microsoft doesn't really update them anymore. The access timestamp is no longer updated automatically. It just needs to be useless appendix. Um, and then there's the file name timestamps. Those are also there. So you have more information. And this is where we have something I mentioned before, the old MS-DOS file name, which is only eight characters, a dot, and only three characters is still there. Microsoft did not actually switch to using long file names directly. They continued to keep the old 8.3 file name and they used uh, a connection between that and the longer name. So it still has some old 8.3 features in the file system, which you can see sometimes when you're doing search commands and such. Um, it's not a clean move forward to the long file name system. It's a sort of a patch on the old 8.3 system. So every file has an 8.3 file name too. And so a lot of uh, hackers will do time stopping, of course, because you mentioned one of the things you do when you try to do instant responses, you see a antivirus alert or something, and then you find the date and time, and then you search all your logs and everything for that date and time. So if they could modify the timestamps, they could hide their attack, make it seem like it happened at a different time. But the user application can only get these um, SI timestamps, not the file name timestamps. You need a program called Time Stopping to do it. Um, there are some programs that can adjust all the time stamps, but a lot of people don't use good enough programs and they don't get them all. So you might see things like this here, where the real time is in 2009, but they stomped it to make it look like it was in 2006. And so if you look at all eight timestamps, you can detect a contradiction. And that would indicate clearly that this file has been modified by some kind of hacking tool. This is not something that should normally happen. So that's, that's an idea and there's a whole uh, SANS uh, PDF here full of all sorts of details about these things. Um, kind of thing we're going to be covering in all these three lectures put together. So let's take a look at a Kahoot. 12A1. Looks like that's that one. And I probably need to make this a little quieter. All right.
All right, I'll give it a few more seconds. All right. All right, what, where do you find the normal modified timestamp that you see in the property sheet? That's the standard information. A pretty good name. All right. So what replaced the fat table? That's the master file table. It's the NTFS improvement of the fat table. All right. All right, what time state is no longer updated? Access is the one that's not really used anymore. Another useless appendix. All right, and what timestamp is not visible in Windows? The entry modified one is not visible anywhere in Windows Explorer. It's a good idea to have these hidden things for forensics. I long ago, I used to teach Microsoft Office and students would try to cheat on the homework, but I could tell from the non-obvious marks inside the file if they had copied that file from somebody else. All right. Those are all real names, that's handy. All right. Because uh, when you copied files, there were marks inside the Microsoft Office documents. Microsoft Office documents store the original owner and the original time it was made and then the time it was copied and who copied it and the file name changed. You know, they keep track of everything because that's important in business to know if a document has been modified. So Microsoft Office keeps marks inside the file that are hard to remove. Yeah, timestamps, owners, original name, all sorts of things. So that if you have something like a contract and somebody modifies the contract, you can go look at this to see if somebody's been modifying it and decide if that was an unauthorized modification or not. So data runs are what's used in the NTFS system to store files. Now in a simple case, you would just start storing data. The, the, the disk is broken up into clusters, four kilobyte clusters. And so if you have a big file, you put four kilobytes of it in the, the cluster 10,000, then cluster 10,001 and 10,002 and 10,003. And that's the simplest and most efficient way to do it. But the problem is, as you erase files and put on more files, the disk drive gets fragmented. So you have an area of, of open clusters and then used clusters and open clusters. So large files get broken into non-contiguous clusters and that's called a data run. So you have to find all the clusters that are not really in order to um, reconstruct a file. All right, so that's what happens to most files, files that are over say a kilobyte. 
they have to be stored in the clusters and a data run of many clusters are used. And there's a system for labeling what the next cluster is so we can piece together those clusters and reconstruct the file. But um, if you, since the master file table entry has 1,024 bytes and that stores everything about the file, it doesn't need all that to store like access permissions and timestamps and everything. There's quite a bit of that left. So it'll, if you have a small file, like up to maybe seven or 800 bytes, it will store it right in the master file table. It will not use any of the clusters at all on the disk. It'll just store the entire file contents in the same metadata area where it stores the file name and the timestamps. And that's called resident files. Um, all right, so that means the master file table itself will have leftover data from previous small files and it gets erased. So you will find fragments of small files inside the master file table and that's called MFT slack. There's also alternate data streams. We've talked about these before. In Windows, you can create a file and then you can treat the file like a direct, like a, um, device letter and store more files inside the file. And that's um, handled by the, uh, the file system. So here you put hello world in a file called out.txt and then you put more text in out.txt colon secret.txt. So now you have a, um, a second content inside here. And if you do dir slash r on a modern version of Windows, you can see it. It'll show you there's out.txt and there's also out.txt colon secret.txt. Older versions of Windows, like I think XP and earlier, did not have any native way to see these. And so people would hide malware in there and stuff. Um, now it's not that secret anymore. So uh, one of the uses of this is when you download a file, you may have noticed, Microsoft will say, you can't open this file. It came from an untrusted source. It uses alternate file streams to add something called zone identifier that tells it where that file came from. So if I, I on my machine, I downloaded iTunes. And if you do dir slash r, it shows you that my iTunes setup has a zone identifier data. And so does this thing called streams.zip that I downloaded. So both of them are marked with where they come from. Now you can remove that with, as always, the Sys internals tool. Mark Rasinovich makes all the tools to do cool stuff in Windows. So you can get this tool called streams, and then you can delete that second file. And now the iTunes setup no longer has this identifier, so it will not be recognized as having come in from, from an untrusted source. All right. And so there's a lot of tools to analyze the master file table. Like I say, there's nothing in Windows that lets you look at it directly. You have to add a tool. SleuthKit is the comprehensive uh, forensic tool that can do it. And there's a bunch of others like Plazo uh, that will just let you examine this. Um, there's Another thing, Microsoft has had a huge problem right from the beginning with finding files on your disk. They used to have Rover, the search dog, and so on. You search for things, it can take five minutes and still fail to find things that are there. Um, Windows 10, for example, you search for something that's right on the start menu and it can't find it. It's amazing how miserable Microsoft is at making search engines. And they have been struggling with it for decades. And so they've made this table called the index table, index attributes to try to make searches faster. And that is important to us for forensics because it often contains metadata from deleted files. So you can find some information about what files used to exist by looking at the index um, part of the master file table sometimes. And we'll see there's even more stuff. This is why if you're doing anything on a Windows machine and you want to lie about it later, you're in big trouble because Microsoft is keeping records of everything you do, not intentionally to spy on you. It's just a side effect of all their automated processes and search indexes and attempts to customize menus and attempts to boot up faster. The end result is they keep all these records about you, just like the EFF is complaining. Everybody wants to stop crime and prevent you from spreading the virus and make sure your parents know where you are and pretty soon they're invading everybody's privacy. It's a natural consequence of sort of a big brother state. Anyway, we did 12A1 and we want to do 12A2, which is somewhere in this mess. 12A2, there we go. What about Mac timestamps? Uh, it's similar. But everything, all the details are different. And uh, we're, I'm not going over it in this course, but I uh, used to in my friends, of course. They have a B tree thing, a whole different system. So does Unix. 
but it essentially stores the same kind of data. Give it a few more seconds. All right. Okay, which one is one kilobyte? That's an entry for one file or folder, all right? By the way, which seemed to me like that means that uh, you can only have a thousand total files or folders, but I think that's not true. It must be that the MFT can grow larger than a megabyte under certain circumstances. Would be interesting to test that out. Anyway, where are the clusters that have the files contents? Where are they listed? That's what's in the data. That's the data run. It stores the information about where the clusters are that are in that particular file. All right, where are the timestamps for deleted files? In the index. All right. And where are the contents of active small files stored? That's resident data in the master file table. Now, if they had been deleted, they'd be in the Slack. SPE, that might be a real initials or something. Wilson's a real name. C is real initials. Good. SPE, I see. Good. Okay, fine. I see who SPE is. Good. So I identified everybody. And let's go back to here. All right. So uh, the log file keeps track of changes which is nice, things like uh, changing, deleting files and directories. Um, and there's a journal number, which is a really important thing to handle uh, when the machine crashes. There were non-journaling file systems like FAT, and when your machine crashed, it would spend half an hour trying to clean up the mess on the drive because all these temporary files would be on the drive from processes that had not finished and it wouldn't know what to do with them. But now it keeps track of a journal, and there are versions of a journal, and so on. And this is part of why if you connect a drive to a Windows machine, it marks the drive even before you start using it. It updates the journal sequence number and so on. This is why you need a write blocker if you want to connect a evidence drive to a Windows machine. And then there are shadow copies. This was something Microsoft introduced with Windows 2000 Server, and it was really quite a big deal. They, that time they made shadow copies of just the system files, but they later expanded it in modern versions of Windows to make copies of all kinds of files, including your documents and everything. And the point of this is you can right click on a document and go in the properties and go to previous versions. It's like an automatic backup system. It keeps old versions of files. Now, if you delete a file, this doesn't do you any good because you don't have any way to get to the previous versions. But it does mean if you modify a file and you wish you could have it back, you can easily get back to the previous version. And it's handled with these volume shadow copies tools like VSS admin and make link. So um, 
here's VSS admin listing the shadow copies and showing this thing contains a shadow copy. It reserves a certain portion of the disk. I used to know, I think it's 10% or something of the disk it uses for all these shadow copies and then throws them away. So you have uh, a variable number of images going back in time. But it often means that you can roll things back and it's used by a system restore point that Microsoft used to have. I think it's still in modern versions of Windows, but they make it harder to find where you can roll the whole machine back to the way it was in the past. It was never that good because although it restores the contents of files, it does not restore the metadata of the files. And therefore it was, it actually is somewhat harmful to the operating system and they never employed it on servers, but they do have shadow copies there for data files anyway. Anyway, the, for forensic purposes and instant response purposes, this is a great place because even if someone has been trying to delete data and hide it, often there's a copy of the old data in the shadow copy. And by the way, the same thing is true of Dropbox. Dropbox keeps backups of everything for 30 days back. So if you get into the Dropbox system, you can find the way things used to be before somebody tried to delete files to hide the evidence. So there are tools here. You can download tools that will help you explore these forensic tools to recover the shadow copies. And so you can look at what the file system used to look like at times in the past. And that's often extremely useful. Now, Microsoft has had simple things, simple features that are like virtual machines. And one of them is SysWow, which we play a lot with in the uh, malware analysis class. If you want to run 32-bit software on a 64-bit version of Windows, it spins up this thing called WOW64, Windows on Windows 64, where it puts the 32-bit process inside this SysWow container, which redirects its attempts to use the file system. So now if your 32-bit program tries to write to the um, registry or system folders, it gets redirected to special system folders, so it cannot mess up your 64-bit operating system. So it's like a virtual machine. It sees a virtual registry and a virtual system folder it can write to and remember things, but it's not the real registry or the real system folders. It's not as complete isolation as a virtual machine at all. It's less isolation even than a container, a Docker container, but these are all ways to do very similar things to make a program run in an illusory system where it doesn't have full access to the system outside it, like a sandbox. So that's the game here. And that means, by the way, if you were to download like a 32-bit antivirus program and run it, it would not be able to really scan the entire drive. It would only see the illusory 32-bit drive and memory. It doesn't really see everything. And that's what rootkits do to your machine. Rootkits, especially the the theoretically most perfect root kit called the blue pill, turn your machine into a virtual machine. And now all your security products are trapped in this virtual machine. And then there's bad things happening outside it that they can't see. Anyway, um, then there's prefetch. We've talked about it before. Every program you launch, it puts a shortcut in the prefetch folder. So that the next time you boot up the machine, Windows will know that you are likely to launch that again. And maybe it should just preload it into memory for you. It does this by creating these PF files and um, makes a bunch of them here, uh, app name ending in PF for all the applications you put up there. And so it's very handy. If you look in the prefetch folder, you will find a list of the last 128 programs that were launched, who launched them, and when they launched them. So that's quite useful. Of course, if it's been too long, then they've been overwritten by newer ones, but you can see what's been happening fairly recently on the uh, on the machine. It isn't too handy because they aren't text files you can open or anything. They're weird little binary files. So you have to get a tool of some kind and there's a project where you play with this. Uh, here's one of the many tools. You just need some tool that will open it up and then show you uh, what program was launched, when it was launched, and so on. Then there's Microsoft event logs, uh, which are painful to use, but you have to get used to them if you're going to do tech support. I used to have teach tech support in one of my projects for students to find an error on their machine and really chase it down until they really found out exactly what caused that error and how to get rid of it, which can take like hours to hunt down. So it keeps track of thousands of events per second typically are happening, piling up in there, and all kinds of things are logged here. Log on attempts, starting and stopping services, printing anything, getting an IP address, antivirus, every program you launch, just huge logs of everything you do are being saved there. 
So the original three event logs, which is the way it still works, is you have application, system, and security. Application is what app developers like Microsoft Word and Firefox, the developer will choose to put something in the log at their discretion. These are system services like loading drivers, and these are things that affect security, like log on and log off, changes in policy, and so on. Uh, that's the idea. And so they're stored in files that are specified here, these EVTX files, some sort of Microsoft database file. And the, uh, there's a local place in the registry where it tells you where they are. And so um, there's application and service logs or elsewhere. This is where you'll find things like firewall and user access control logs. And when you try to understand these logs, the most important number is the event ID. Microsoft puts an event ID number on every log entry, and it turns out that that is extremely useful. You can Google that event ID number, and there's a bunch of people that make um, forums and information pages that record what caused an event ID log entry and what you can do about it, and that is extremely useful. The Microsoft internal resources about events are not much use, but the third party non-Microsoft forums are often extremely useful. When you have some problem, you look in the log, you find some error, then you Google it, and it's very useful. Can you send event logs to Splunk? Yes, you can, absolutely. And that is what you do with Sysmon. Uh, Sysmon is the best tool for that. You put on Sysmon, which is a Microsoft tool, and then you add the configuration file from Swift on security, who's a Twitter celebrity and a Windows engineer, and he will choose the most important event logs and send them to Splunk. You could probably send them all to Splunk, but that would be counterproductive because it would be thousands of unnecessary junk. The uh, Sysmon configuration from uh, Swift on security is a very good place to pick like the 20 or 30 events that are useful and send them to Splunk, and we got projects that do that. Yeah, it's very good. Anyway, so you see logon events, like here's a 540 showing a network logon by the administrator on this domain and their network address and the workstation they're using. Yeah, Swift on security. A big Twitter celebrity, let me bring it up. Um, he's apparently a fan of the singer, Taylor Swift. Um, there is Swift on security. A big, uh, a big celebrity, and usually has pictures of Taylor Swift all the time. Anyway, he wrote a um, thing, Swift on security, Sysmon configuration. Yep, there it is. He made a GitHub repository, and this is where you go. Swift on security, Sysmon config. This is where you go to get a configuration file that is very good. And technically, you should customize it, but this is a really good place to start. Um, and if you put this on, and you'll see you're doing it in the projects, um, this is how you get a good selection of Microsoft events to go into Splunk. And you can even use it without Splunk and put it, it'll just appear in a named folder in the Windows Event Viewer. And it's a way to clean up the Microsoft event logs and give you a, a shorter list of logs that are more rich in information. Anyway. So you see the login ID, login types, there are different ways you can log in, um, like as a service, as a batch file. Interactive means typing on a keyboard there or connecting over the network. So it records, you know, who logged in, where did they come from, uh, what was their IP address, and all kinds of things like that. So you'll learn a lot about who's logging in. And of course, this is really important because if somebody is hacking in, they're finding some way to log in that is not the usual way, and you can use all these events to help detect the unauthorized logins and how they differ from the normal logins that should be happening. And that's lateral movement. Um, if you remember the attack um, matrix, people will first get to run code on your machine, then they will try to um, maintain persistence on your machine, and then they will try to harvest credentials from whatever machine they've got control of and try to move to lateral movement and move to more other parts of your network. And that's what you're trying to catch here. And these log entries are often quite useful for that. So here's an example. Uh, somebody has a Windows 7 machine. Uh, they trick that person with phishing or something into installing software on the machine. So now they have some the ability to execute code on that machine. So now they run... Um, he joins a corporate domain, and now they sneak onto another person's machine because they found something like stored credentials on there. And now they have a local administrator and a domain administrator, which is 
used to be quite common. Now people try to prevent that. But, um, and then they mount a C share. Once they can get to a shared folder, they can use sysinternals PS exec to launch processes on the other machine through the Windows file share protocol. And then you can do a remote desktop connection to something if you find the credentials for that. And on you go into the domain controller and the web server and everything. That's just what they do. And you'll see a whole trail of events on all these Windows machines as they go through if you're looking for them. And if you have a good system like Splunk where all the events go to one place and you have qualified people watching it. So it's uh, that's why we're doing all this because people hackers are doing this to everybody. And if you haven't prepared for it, you're not going to notice it or be able to stop them. So here's the kind of things you'll get a login event. You get another login event as you move to the domain controller. You get logins at every step. Every time you move to another machine, there'll be events out there. So their security logs also record if you're changing things like creating another user account, promoting somebody to administrator, changing policies like turning off auditing. You can turn on auditing on folders and objects so it records everybody that goes into a certain folder if it's important to you and you could turn that off. And if it's turned off, that, that change in policy will also generate a log. By the way, you could delete the logs. That's a problem. But if you do, there is an event noting the log was cleared and you'll see a gap in time. So if attackers are trying to erase the logs, then you can see that if you hunt for it, just like you can see if they've been changing the timestamps on the files. Um, uh, if you do the project, you'll see the whole point of Splunk is to get logs, you forward logs to it. And all Splunk is is a search engine to search through the logs. Uh, you can delete Microsoft logs with command line command. I think it's in the GUI too. You can delete log files. It's not made difficult at all. If you have administrator rights, you can do it. And there are hacking tools that do it too. Um, if Windows keeps track of everything, isn't audit redundant? Uh, no, it does not keep track of everything by default. It keeps track of a large set of things, but for example, it does not record every time you open a folder and every time you double click on a file to edit it. It doesn't record that. Um, that would take too much data, so you can turn on extra auditing. And if you do, it tends to slow down the machine, but it puts more things in the log. So it's adjustable. But if you don't change anything, it records a certain default amount of information. The point of Microsoft event logging is not for security. The point of event logging is to fix problems for tech support. So it's really just trying to log things to see if something's broken. And if you really want to protect yourself, oh, um, I used to know how to do that. Uh, there's an audit policy. You can do it in group policy. You can do it in local security policy, secpol.msc. That's the main place you do it. Um, unless you're in a domain and then you do it in GP edit. It's a good point. I'm glad you remind me. I used to teach this stuff years ago, back in the days of XP. Anyway, yeah, and in fact, right here, you audit in local, local security policy or group policy. And um, so then you can have service events. It'll typically record when services start and stop. Um, and as you know, that's typically how you do persistence. You'll put something in like the run key. So every time you boot up the machine, it will launch and edit to one of those SVC host uh, groups is one of the many ways you do it. And then uh, that'll be in the service events. So if you run PS, uh, Yes, Windows certification does cover all this. Um, if you do the um, tech support search, used to be Microsoft desktop support technician, always that. Uh, if you take the first Windows cert, it covers it a little bit. If you take the first or second server cert, it really covers this. They talk about how to monitor everything on your server because it's really important. Yeah. And so here's what you'll see for PS exec. PS exec is that Sysmo, uh, Sys internals tool. Um, yeah, you, yeah, eventid.net is a very good resource. I use it all the time. And if you, that you search for anything by event ID there and you'll find a nice forum of useful information. So for example, here, 7035, let's give it a try. I should be able to go to eventid.net. And um, I don't, like 7035. Service control manager, five comments. So here's people telling you what this event is and what kind of malware would cause it or something and what you can do about it. It's very nice. Looks like maybe they put some of this behind a paywall or something, but there are other ones. So I can say, this is the first thing you do is find the event ID. Next thing that's useful is to know the actual source, but 
the event ID by itself is often enough to greatly help you um, research a problem or an event. You, you look in the log, you find some events, and then you Google those events or go to your favorite online forum. And you can get, often it'll explain exactly what's causing this problem and what you should do about it. Because there's a lot of problems on Windows servers that are hard to figure out. And uh, the system log is very useful. Same thing as your Linux, by the way. Every time you have trouble with Linux, you want to go find the log and look at it, and that will greatly help you figure out what the problem is and fix it. So you can look for suspicious things, um, people using PS exec that shouldn't be, uh, errors that are caused by malicious binaries. So you look for antivirus alerts, of course. Uh, your log files, by default, have a relatively small size, and when they get full, they throw away the old entries. So it is a common security feature to make them bigger. Um, and uh, by the way, there is, this is an old Microsoft database, like the one they used to use for um, Outlook Express to store emails. And for some reason, it gets corrupted a lot. So there's a tool you can download to fix a corrupted event log database. Microsoft used, has moved away from these things, but um, they used to use these proprietary binary databases for all sorts of things. And for some reason, they frequently got broken. So there's Event Viewer is the built-in tool you get with Windows. And there are other tools you can get like Log Parser and Playzo and other ones. And like I say, my favorite is of course Spunk these days. And that I think is everybody's favorite. Um, the, it is really the nicest way to search through all the log entries. And then there are scheduled tasks. This is what you call cron jobs in the Linux world. In Microsoft, it's the same thing. It's extremely powerful. You can schedule automated tasks of any kind to happen anytime you want. Um, you can do it with just the at command on a, on a command line, at 1625 execute this. It will run that program at that time. That's one simple way to do it. But usually you use the GUI scheduled tasks, or you can do it with the SCH task command at the command line, and you can tell it to automatically launch things at boot up or a certain time after boot up or at a certain time of day every day or uh, when certain events happen or when certain services start or almost anything you can think of. Um, they end up in job files that persist only until shutdown or reboot. And I guess they're recreated when you reboot them and you'll find one file here per task in system root tasks. And those, uh, it has logs too that record the start time and completion of tasks. And it also creates, of course, event logs and security logs when these automated tasks uh, take place. And it's one of the many ways to gain persistence. You can have an automatic task that restarts your malware. So you can open these job files. And once again, there's some silly Microsoft proprietary binary format. But you can see the strings. Um, and you can get a thing called job parser. And then you can see what's going on here. And it'll tell you. Uh, don't start if on batteries, it hasn't yet run. This is something that's going to automatically launch Notepad under certain conditions. And there's a log, scheduled task log. We'll just show you this job started at this time, that job finished, and this job started, and so on. So you can see what's happening. And so you'll see Event Viewer has got it. Um, this task was registered and then updated and then launched and on it goes. You, it's recording everything. So you can see what automatic tasks are running. All right, so 12A3, let me get rid of some of these. 12A3 right there, okay. Yeah, all the slides are on my webpage. Yeah. Just go to the page 152 and go below the schedule and you'll see all the slides are on there. Thank you. 
right? I think that might be about it. Apparently so. All right, a complete copy of the whole volume. Okay, that's the shadow copy. Good. All right. And what prevents a 32-bit app from messing up a 64-bit system? That's a redirector, a simple sort of sandbox. All right. Where do login attempts go? That's a security event. Good. And one instance per task. That's a job file. Okay, which one of these persists until a reboot? Okay, the job files are regenerated after reboot. Raymond is six. XC, all right. And Wilson. Good. All right. I've got all the winners. So I'll stop this recording and then stick around to answering.